How's it going, guys? Arterial venous disease stress test for Yosemite. Arterial disease is going to be atherosclerosis in your peripheral arteries, namely in the legs, due to diabetes, smoking, hypertension. And they'll tell you that there are non palpable or one plus dorsalis pedis slash popliteal pulses. Okay, two to four plus is normal. Four plus is considered brisk, but it's still normal on Yosemite. Don't read into that. But the diminished peripheral pulses, that is the hallmark. And the lower legs can have trophic changes, so shiny, glabrous skin. Glabrous means without hair, so you can lose the hair on the lower legs. You need to be able to diagnose this, uh, so spot diagnosis arterial ulcer. Punched out small ulcers on the feet slash toes. Okay, this in contrast to venous ulcers, which I'll talk about soon, which are large and slothy, located at the malleoli on the ankles. So... Highest yield point for arterial disease for your simile. I know some of you are studying for step one. Got to ace your 2CK eventually. Okay, so ABI is ankle brachial indices. You're compa comparing the blood pressure in the leg to the blood pressure in the arm. And if the ratio is under 0 0.9, that is our first initial diagnostic step for peripheral vascular disease. It means we have atherosclerosis in the vessels of the legs, which is why we have a diminution or reduction of the blood pressure in the leg compared to the arm. So if it's under 0 0.9, then we're going to continue with our diagnosis. But I just want to mention that there's one fucking question out there where they don't list ABIs as the first step. They list ultrasound. If I don't mention it, I will get a DM at some point where someone says, oh, you said ABIs were first, but this question says ultrasound. I'm just letting you know. 14 out of 15 times, ABI is what we do first. But there's one question where they don't list ABI. So you're like, what the hell? And then ultrasound is there. Okay, so just know that it exists. But I'll tell you what's definitely wrong. Answers like angiography as a first step, definitely wrong. Okay, so this is dense, and I'll break this down for you real fucking nice and cleanly. Okay, you're going to get a patient who has EG, intermittent claudication. You say, that's arterial disease. ABI is first. Now, let's say they tell you in the question, ABIs are already done and they're 0 0.6. Next best step, if it's listed, is an exercise stress test to determine exercise tolerance. If that's not listed, the question will have as the answer, recommend a walking slash exercise program. So about 50% of the time, they want the exercise stress test as the next best step, determine exercise tolerance. You look for it as the answer, it's not listed, but you see prescribe a walking program, prescribe an exercise program, recommend a walking program. You see that, you'll choose that as the answer, okay? So that's really important for you to assimilate. And then next best step is angiography. As I said, I've never seen it as correct in theory, in real life. I mean, you could technically do it, but I've never seen it as correct. It's always wrong. Celostazole is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor that can be given to patients who are already on a walking program that... It's an arterial vasodilator, so it can have some utility in these patients, but don't choose it as an initial answer pretty much 14 out of 15 times, okay, in terms of it's basically always wrong, all right? If, they, if it's a farm question where it's just five drugs listed and they say which could uh, help mitigate the symptoms in this patient who's already on a walking program, the answer would be celastazole in that case. So I've never seen surgery as answers. We talk about angioplasty, stenting, and arterectomy bypass. These are more for QBank, okay, which will get highly technical. Never fucking seen them assessed on NBME material. So I talked about in my carotid stenosis presentation about how patients who are below the end arterectomy thresholds where they will be on a triad of medications. The same triad applies to peripheral vascular disease patients where number one, they're going to be on an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin II receptor blocker. Yosemite tends to just have lisinopril as the answer. Number two, they're going to be on a statin. Doesn't matter which statin, low intensity, high intensity, Yosemite doesn't give a fuck. Okay, they'll just list a statin. And then number three, antiplatelet therapy. Aspirin is basically just always the answer in Yosemite. Okay, they can have in real life aspirin alone, aspirin diprotamol the combo, clopidogrel alone, just aspirin. So what they're going to do oftentimes give you two of the three and then want you to choose the third. So they'll say, you got this patient on a walking program and has intermittent claudication. Solosal is not one of the drugs, don't worry. And they'll say, he's on aspirin and he's on a statin, uh, which the following should be out of this patient's regimen. And the answer is lisinopril. Okay? And the blood pressure will be like a little bit elevated, so there's no 
uh, debate, okay? Or they'll tell you patients on lisinopril, patients on a statin, uh, which the following should be out of this patient's regimen, answers aspirin, okay? Or they'll give you all three the patients on already, say which the following should be done to this patient's regimen, the answer is no changes necessary, okay? Very high yield. Now venous disease in contrast is valvular incompetence, usually idiopathic familial. The patient need not have varicose veins. Varicose veins are just one type of venous disease. So you're going to do an ultrasound. Uh, I'll, well, I'll get to that, but you're going to be, you're going to, you do an ultrasound and the patient can have venous backflow or demonstration of venous incompetence seen on the ultrasound, but there's no varicose veins. That's venous disease, okay? DV, active DVT and superficial thrombophlebitis can be sequela of venous disease, but a patient can just be walking around with venous incompetence, okay, with no DVT, superficial thrombophlebitis, no varicose veins. So peripheral pulses are normal, which makes sense because uh, the it's the veins that are affected, okay, not the arteries. And this image of brawny edema, so when you have venous disease, valvular incompetence, you're going to have increased hydrostatic pressure within the peripheral veins slash venules, leading to extravasation of not just fluid, but hemosiderin. That will deposit, lead to darkening of the skin over time. So brawny edema, I've seen an NBME question. They can say post phlebitic syndrome. They can say stasis dermatitis. These are all terms that refer to the skin changes here. And then as I mentioned before, the Arterial ulcers are small and punched out, usually distal in the feet, toes. Venous ulcers, in contrast, are large and slothy, located at the medial malleoli. Now, uh, duplex ultrasonography to diagnose. Ultrasound, 100% of the time, will be the answer for first step. So arterial disease, we said we did ABIs first, right? 14 out of 15 times ABIs, 1 out of 15 ultrasound. Venous disease, it's ultrasound, okay? And then compression stockings is what they want next, 14 out of 15 times. Okay, don't you love these ratios here? But it's pretty simple. They'll show you a patient who's, let's say, got brawny edema here. And then for the ulcer picture, they'll just want venous disease as the answer, okay? They're not going to get into debate it, debatable territory as to do you do compression stockings when the patient has an active ulcer? Do we debride a necrotic tissue? but it still will be compression stockings. But what they're gonna do when you assimilate, show you an image such as this, the brownie edema, where they'll tell you there's valvular incompetence on ultrasound, and then just compression stockings. That's what they want next. Very buzzy, okay? And then answers such as sclerosing, glue agents, venous stripping, wrong fucking answers on you assimilate. Now, I mentioned before that if a patient has valvular incompetence, that that will increase the risk for because of stasis, turbulence, increases the risk for clots leading to DVT, superficial thrombophlebitis. Now, DVT is going to be in your femoral vein where a patient can have a painful leg, often with swelling, and you'd say, okay, that sounds like a DVT. We're going to do ultrasound first to diagnose. Superficial thrombophlebitis, the stem will tell you there is a one centimeter painful, warm, palpable cord at the ankle that may or may not track up to the knee and that's your superficial thrombophlebitis and so for dvt and stp they want heparin as the answer okay so there's one very tricky question out there where they give you a superficial thrombophlebitis it's an active clot and compression stockings are wrong it's subcutaneous anoxaparin but it's not ultra difficult if you think about it if they were to give you a dvt it's the same deal. You say, well, we're going to do heparin first. Like compression stockings isn't the first thing we're going to do. Okay. Now, stress test general points. This is as per my observation across NBME exams. In terms of all the questions I've seen, when do stress tests show up in questions? Not just some arbitrary bullshit list here. So they love perioperative MI risk. They might tell you patient is smoker, history of chest pain, and is going to have surgery. And then you're going to have, they'll say which the following is the most appropriate next step in management. And the answer would be a stress test that's listed as one of the answers because while well, they're having surgery, so you want to assess perioperative MI risk. And then you're going to do patients who have a predictable, stable angina, chest pain with exertion. Well, you're going to do a stress test. Okay. You do usually an ECG stress test, which I'll talk about the different types looking for ST wave depressions. And then if a patient has left heart failure, 
uh, so dyspnea with exertion, you're going to be doing a, an echo stress test usually to look for decreased ejection fraction. And then, as I mentioned before, uh, after you get the low ABIs for arterial disease, you're going to do an exercise stress test if listed. If not, you go straight to the exercise walking program. USMLE tends to be pretty nice, very rare that they're going to list multiple stress tests and then have you choose between the two. I've seen one question where they do that. Okay. I said, I say one out of five here, you know, for that, that they'll do that, but uh, it's pretty rare. Okay. Maybe even one out of 10. So ECG exercise stress test is our bread and butter standard common stress test. If patient has chest pain with exertion, stable angina, you're going to uh, get him or her on a treadmill and then you're going to look for. ST depressions, ischemia with exertion. It requires the patient as a normal baseline ECG, meaning you can't have atrial fibrillation, you can't have a left bundle branch block. Okay, if they list any type of abnormality in the ECG, you know ECG stress test is wrong. It's a high yield point because it's an easy way to eliminate it as an answer. So, what they'll do is give you a 15 line massive paragraph and uh, they'll tell you that a patient has a left bundle branch block, let's say. And as I just said, you can eliminate it right away as an answer because I'll basically have the students mem trying to memorize. They'll say, okay, I understand. When a patient has a left bundle branch block, we don't do an ECG stress test. I'm like, no, 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 it's not, a, it's not the LBBB specifically. They don't give a fuck. It's any ECG change. You're not going to do the ECG stress test. In addition, they can tell you uh, this patient who has the abnormal baseline ECG gets shortness of breath with exertion, no chest pain, which would be an indication for doing an echo stress test looking for left heart failure, not an ECG stress test looking for ischemic heart disease, So, which I'll talk about now. So if we have left heart failure, so ejection fraction should be 55 to 70%, patients of left heart failure are going to have a reduced ejection fraction. Now let's say at rest, a patient has a normal ejection fraction. There's no shortness of breath at rest. If they tell you a patient walks up a flight of stairs, doesn't get chest pain. It's not ischemic heart disease with atherosclerosis leading to angina pectoris. It's not one of those presentations, but patient gets a little bit of dyspnea walking up a flight of stairs. It could mean that the, uh, the increased myocardial oxygen demand causes decompensation leading to left, uh, bringing clinically out the left heart failure with the exertion. So we can pick that up on a stress test. So we do an exercise echo and we see, oh, when the patient exerts himself, the ejection fraction falls. That confirms our transthoracic echo. That confirms our left heart failure. But at rest, the ejection fraction was normal. And as I said, they can double it up with the patient as an abnormal baseline ECG, left bundle branch block as an example. And you're like, cool, definitely not the exercise ECG stress test. As I just fucking said, abnormal baseline ECG is an indication for not doing that, doing something like exercise echo instead. And then pharmacologic stress tests, there's many, dobutamine echo, Uh So I'll talk about those more specifically, but just for the moment, I'm letting you know if you see those as answer choices, because they won't write thallium stress test. They'll just have like choice E, thallium, and you would need to know that means a pharmacologic stress test. Now, what's going to happen is they could give you a scenario where patient has history of uh, angina pectoris and needs a stress test. And they'll tell you he or she's going to be having a triple A repair. And you'll say, okay, we need to assess perioperative MI risk. We'd be doing a stress test in this patient. But then you look at the answers and you don't see any exercise stress tests there. You just see thallium. Okay. And you say, well, patient can't exercise. It's the only stress test listed. I guess that makes sense. That's a pharmacologic stress test. So they're usually nice. They're not going to give you multiple stress tests. You just need to say, okay, that's the pharmacologic stress test. That's what we do in this patient. Dobutamine is a beta-1 agonist. It's going to increase chronotropy heart rate and increase oxygen demand. And then we can do an echo at the same time to look for decreased ejection fractions. So patients who have heart failure, for instance. Uh, so it can be perioperative, as we mentioned. It could be patients who have difficulty exercising, let's say osteoarthritis of the hip. Okay, so it can be different indications for not wanting to exercise. And then thallium. Diperidamol is a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, dilates arteries, similar to celostazole. Okay, very similar mechanism of action. But when we dilate peripheral arterials, baroreceptor reflex, so we're going to increase heart rate to compensate. And then you can do a radio tracer like thallium 
and you can look at the perfusion of the myocardium, okay? So that's another type of pharmacologic stress test. Now, myocardial perfusion scan, I'm just letting you know that the, the terms myocardial perfusion scan and cardiac scintigraphy are the same as pharmacologic stress tests for all intents and purposes on USMLE. So as I just said, if you have a patient who's a AAA repair and perioperative, and you're like, well, we do a pharmacologic stress test to assess for pharmacologic, uh, we would do a, a stress test to evaluate for perioperative MI risk. The answer could be thallium. It could be myocardial perfusion scan. It could be cardiac scintigraphy. So they're the same for all intents and purposes in USMLE, okay? But it's technically a phrase that's referred to using any type of radio tracer for the point of doing a stress test. And a way that if we want to get really fucking technical, a pharmacologic stress test never involves exercise, but a, but a myocardial perfusion scan does, okay? So... You can have a myocardial perfusion scan incorporates both exercise and non-exercise radio tracer evaluations, but a pharmacologic stress test is only non-exercise. And then cardiac scintigraphy is even broader, which incorporates myocardial perfusion scans. It incorporates pharmacologic stress tests, but it can also just be done in patients who you're just evaluating their anatomy. Okay, you're evaluating perhaps inflammatory effects on the heart. Okay. But as I told you, what they'll do is tell you a, a patient goes up a flight of stairs, gets chest pain, and then the answer is just cardiac scintigraphy is the next best step. You're going to do a pharma, it's a pharmacologic stress test, interchangeable for you similarly. Okay, so as I just fucking said, all right, so they can have that as the answer for uh, what you do in a patient who needs a pharmacologic stress test. Okay, so... Not dramatic, arterial venous disease, stress tests, obviously make more clips and subscribe to my channels. Appreciate it.